fun. Good morning. Thank you for joining us inside this uh, airless, uh, windowless room on this beautiful Saturday morning. We are here to talk about the imperial presidency, uh, the scope and limits of executive power, a hallmark recurring defining issue of the 21st century through two presidencies so far. Uh, we're going to move quite along because we have an excellent panel. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are deeply familiar with this topic already. The 10,000-foot reminder is that uh, President Bush came into office with a very powerful vice president whose experiences is chief of staff in the Ford administration after Watergate in Vietnam and during the church committee had marked him as a strong proponent of executive power and critic of congressional regulation of it. And he used that position of influence and the crisis of the September 11 era uh, to advance established precedents uh, that a president as commander in chief in wartime cannot be bound by congressional statutes, international law, treaties, and other constraints, uh, leading to tremendous controversy in areas like torture and surveillance. President Obama, the constitutional uh, lawyer, came in promising hope and change, and it seemed like a corner was being turned, but soon found himself also uh, being criticized from both his left and his right for his own uh, strong assertion in various ways of executive power. He's largely shied away from the commander-in-chief override theory that was the uh, hallmark of the Bush administration. Uh, but in both accepting that the war on terror was a real war and advancing a use of uh, targeting and detention authority that was thereby authorized by this war, which not everyone agrees with in international affairs, and once faced with a Congress after the 2010 Tea Party midterm election that was not uh, a, a helper of his agenda, but rather uh, rather obstructionist to that agenda, and in some cases incapable of acting, he began becoming more and more assertive about executive action in domestic affairs, ranging from uh, refusing to defend the constitutionality of the Defense of Marriage Act to uh, aggressively interpreting what he could do uh, under the uh, Obamacare to fix provisions and glitches and typos that Congress was refusing to fix for him. And then, of course, most famously uh, asserting that he could uh, 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 shield from deportation entire categories of millions of undocumented immigrants, leading to various lawsuits and disputes and criticism from the right that he was imperial in his own way. So as his uh, presidency starts to wind down, and we look forward to the third 21st century post 9-11 presidency, it's an appropriate time to pause and reflect on the experiences of the last 15 years and see where we might be going in terms of the future of American-style democracy and separation of powers. And we have an excellent panel uh, here, a diverse panel of, of all-stars to help us think through these questions. I'm going to introduce each of them before their first question, rather than presenting you with a block of bio to digest all at once. We're going to go through a couple rounds up here, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. And I'm supposed to read you a couple things. Turn off your cell phones. Um, if you want to write questions, if you want to ask questions, it's not raising your hand or going to a microphone. The ACS staff will uh, raise your hand, and they'll give you an index card. And then at some point, the cards will be brought up to me so I can filter out your crazy speeches. Uh, if you want to Twitter cover this, the hashtag is ACS16, and the handle is at ACS Law. Remember that this, you can get CLE credit for this, because we're also smart. And right after this is uh, probably the highlight of the morning. Neil Eggleston, the current White House counsel, will speak. So we're going to get out of here promptly at 1045 so that you can see the main event, which is him. OK, so let's get going. Um, we're going to start today with Hina Shamsi. She is the director of the National Security Project at the ACLU, which tries to ensure that US national security practices and policies are consistent with the Constitution, civil liberties, and human rights. And she frequently litigates cases regarding freedom of speech and association, challenging targeted killing, torture, unlawful detention, uh, and post-9-11 discrimination against religious and racial minorities. Uh, she's a graduate of Northwestern University School of Law, and she also teaches at Columbia Law School. So Hina, why don't you kick us off? Uh, you know, we've seen through the, uh, in the Obama era, a rise of a sort of anti-Obama left uh, that critiques him for continuing and entrenching the war on terror as they see it. 
What do you see as the powers that the Obama administration has claimed regarding targeting and detention outside of traditional armed conflict zones, and what are the policy consequences uh, of his decision to do those things? Thank you, Charlie, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I want to begin by just acknowledging that the last couple of days have sometimes been depressing in terms of conversations about a progressive vision of the Constitution, but more often really inspiring. And I was thinking about that this morning when uh, I was thinking about talking to you, and the fact that um, not only is there not really a progressive vision with respect to a critically important area, war powers, but I think that the vision that the founders had with respect to structure in the Constitution with respect to war powers is on the verge of being broken. Now, war powers are critically important because once they are uh, given to the executive branch, they vest largely unchecked authority in the president to wield the coercive power of the state to use lethal force and detain without traditional procedural protections. To ensure that those awesome powers are uh, exercised with wisdom and restraint, of course, the Constitution gives to Congress um, perhaps the most fundamental and important uh, obligation it has, which is the responsibility to declare war by specifying enemies, by defining clear objectives, and setting limits that keep the executive's war powers within bounds. I don't think that it is any secret to any of us that Congress has failed to do that, and it continues to fail to do that. So in the absence of responsible congressional action, we're now fighting multiple wars in multiple countries under the basis of a 2001 AUMF, Authorization for Use of Military Force, uh, that was specific with respect to authority given um, tied to 9-11, those responsible for it, Taliban and core Al-Qaeda. But since then, the wars in which uh, we are engaged are against groups that have the most tenuous, if any, connection to core Al-Qaeda, in some cases are hostile to it. That's in the context of traditional armed conflict and recognized armed conflict. And Charlie, your question, the back, that's an important backdrop to that question, but I think another significant concern is claims of war-based authority to use lethal force and detain outside of armed conflict in countries with which um, and in which we are not at war. That theory continues to underlie targeting authority and it continues to underlie uh, the claims of authority to keep people detained at Guantanamo uh, without charge or trial. And I think when thinking about how that authority has been wielded by the Obama administration, um, it's important to think about some of the ways in which um, there's a difference in approach between the Obama administration and the Bush administration. One line of argument about the difference in approach goes that um, unlike the Bush administration, which claimed uh, Article II commander-in-chief authority to override obligations under international treaties and domestic laws, for example, the ban on torture, laws on warrantless surveillance, um, the Obama administration doesn't do that. That it instead has recognized constraints through an internal process, careful consideration within the executive branch, analysis of presidential authority through interpretations of international and domestic law as opposed to theories that would flout it. But there's a process problem with that and there's a substantive problem with that. The process problem is that claims of war-based authority outside of areas in which we are not in an armed conflict as recognized by most of the rest of the world and interpretations of uh, international law, um, on the basis of that authority, the executive branch claims that, and, and in the face of congressional inaction, the executive branch claims that it can take action that have critical impact on civil liberties, the right to life, the right to liberty, um, without review by the judicial branch or with deference from the judicial branch. Okay, I'm gonna cut you off there just so we can move along, but we'll come back, and so if you wanna keep going on that screen in round two, please do. But now I wanna to move to Marty Lederman, 
He's a professor at Georgetown Law School. During the Bush years, he became famous as a blogging critic of Bush, uh, the Bush theories, advanced, expansive theories of commander-in-chief override power. Uh, and indeed, with his uh, colleague David Barron, co-authored a seminal uh, book-length uh, study of that that was published in the Harvard Law Review. And when the Obama administration came in, he served as the number two official in the Office of Legal Counsel for the first two years, where it was his turn and their turn to grapple with extremely difficult questions raised by the rule of law and the threat posed by terrorism. Uh, as everyone knows, most famously, uh, they helped, worked on an issue uh, regarding whether it was lawful to target an American citizen uh, deemed to be a terrorist operating abroad in a place where his capture was in unfeasible, infeasible. Uh, he also uh, was involved in reviewing all of the Bush era, then classified Office of Legal Counsel opinions on issues like torture, and then pushing to make them public in 2009. He is a graduate of Yale Law School and a former clerk to Judge Coffin on the First Circuit. And Marty, I was wondering whether you could pick up actually on the theme that, that Hina was just starting to elucidate and help us take a step back and think about what do we mean when we say an imperial president's uh, imperial presidency, what are the different categories uh, of things that that might mean within uh, a more rigorous framework of law? Well, thanks, Charlie, and thanks to ACS, as always, and good morning. It's wonderful to be here with this wonderful panel, and I hope our uh, discussion will, will sort of tease out some of these questions of what do we mean and, and the rhetoric of imperial presidency. So I do want to take issue with the premise of the panel. Um, I don't think there's anything resembling an imperial presidency. I don't think there even was during the Bush administration. And there certainly isn't during the Obama administration. So just for starters, I'd like to sort of frame how I'm thinking about these things in, th in three ways. So the first is that point, is that, that, that a, a real, truly imperial president would feel very much unbound to do whatever he or she feels is in the best interests of the nation. And I think Jack Goldsmith's book, Power and Constraint, actually quite accurately describes how even in the Bush administration, that's not remotely true. No president can enact or put into place 5% or 10% of what he or she would ideally do if there were no Congress, if there were no courts, if there were no press. And in particular, if there were no oversight process with, between the executive branch and, and Congress, which does impose a much more powerful constraint than the public generally understands. So I commend Jack's book to that effect. But also I think there's a big difference between the sense of, the, the sense of authority that the Bush administration exercised and what the Obama administration has been willing to do. That's point number one. Point number two is I think it matters for purposes of what goes on within the executive branch. What you f whether you feel constrained by treaty, international law, and statute, and constitutional constraints really plays a dramatic role in how decisions are made within the executive branch. And your book, Charlie, demonstrates that better than any other single source that I can think of. And the third point I want to make is that Really, these issues for the future depend somewhat not only on what the administrations, the executive branches have done, but perhaps more importantly, how they are perceived and described in the press. And so if everyone goes around claiming there's an imperial presidency, and the Bush and the Obama administrations are exactly the same, and the president ultimately can do whatever he or she wants without constraint, I think that actually is corrosive. I think it leads to executive branches thinking or many officials within executive branches, thinking that there is this kind of liberty and, the, and this expanse of, of authority where there really truly isn't. Let me follow up yeah. your initial five minutes here. Give me three examples where Obama was, didn't do something he wanted to do because of the law. Well, I'll just, I'll just cite your blog post, Charlie. So the, the, most, dramatic, the most dramatic was, I'm sitting here with a table in the front with, 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 with Greg Craig and Neil Eggleston and Cliff Sloan. Ask Cliff how his life would have been different if there were no statutory constraints in place. Cliff Sloan, in, who in, formally negotiated Guantanamo transfers. Right, in terms, in terms of negotiating transfers of Guantanamo detainees, it would have been radically different, right? It, if there were no congressional oversight, if there were no statutory constraints and the like. Every day, executive branch officials find themselves constrained. Okay, so Guantanamo transfers. The Guantanamo transfers, uh, you, you mentioned the, the Doc Duke prosecution. Syria, is, the Syria 2013 is among the most important examples, I think. There was a lot of pressure on the president, both inside and outside the administration, to use force unilaterally, without statutory authority, and in my view, in violation of the UN Charter, against Assad 
for very good reasons, because he was slaughtering civilians with chemical weapons, a very sympathetic case. And ultimately, according to um, his interview with Jeff Goldberg, um, Je he found himself, the president surprised many people within the executive branch by deciding not to do so. He found himself recoiling from the idea of an attack unsanctioned by international law and by Congress. Okay, so that's a pretty there. big. That's a pretty big decision. But let me just tick off what All I right. think are the... Last thought. Oh, are my five up? Okay. So just for framing purposes, and then we can get to the other things later. I think if you think about this in terms of our you know, well-known Youngstown framework, what are the controversial things the Obama administration has done, either without congressional authority in so-called Category 2 or in violation of statute Category 3? And the first category, I would say, um, the first few days of attacks on ISIL in Iraq, and most importantly, the initiation of the Libya operation, which I think Sai might talk a little bit about. Um, those are assertions of executive authority without statutory authorization that are more modest than the Bush administration, but less modest than, for instance, what Hina might, might propose. In terms of actually disregarding statutes, I think the two big examples are the Jerusalem passport case where the court affirmed the president's power to not put Israel on the passport, and the Bergdahl trade. Uh, which is a hard and difficult case, and one worth when talking moved, about. When he moved Guantanamo prisoners out of Guantanamo without obeying the 30-day waiting period. Right, he was, the statute required that there be a 30-day um, notification to Congress before making the trade with the Taliban to, move, to remove the Taliban prisoners in exchange for Bergdahl, and they didn't abide by that. And that's a hard and difficult case that ought to be discussed. But with those exceptions, the vast majority of the things that have occasioned such dispute and claims of imperial presidency are issues of statutory interpretation. Let me stop you there. That's yeah, a good okay. lead into the next person. So Naomi Ray is a professor at George Mason University's Law School, recently renamed the Antonin Scalia Law School, not the Antonin Scalia School of Law. <laughs> so, she teaches constitutional law, legislation, comparative constitutional law. She previously served as an associate White House counsel uh, during the second term of the Bush administration. And she's written extensively about the nature of dignity rights in constitutional law. She testified as a Republican witness in the Supreme Court confirmation hearing for Justice Sotomayor. She's a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School and was also a clerk to Justice Thomas. Uh, so we've been talking about uh, foreign policy, national security abroad. We've been talking about commander-in-chief override theory. But of course, a lot of the controversies in this era have been about domestic law and about whether President Obama is being too aggressive in assert, uh, interpreting the scope of power delegated to him by statute. So Naomi, could you talk a little bit about uh, immigration fights and the Obamacare interpretation fights and so forth? How legitimate are the interpretations put forward by the Obama administration? Have they gone too far in your view? Sure. Um yeah, I think, um, you know, following up on what, what Marty said, I think a lot of the disputes in this administration have turned on statutory questions, especially in the domestic context. And, and I think there's some interesting um, aspects to this, right? So instead of taking broad claims of constitutional power, um, things have been sort of pushed into the realm of statutory interpretation. And I think once you're talking about interpreting statutes, there is... Um, you know, it's much less interesting to the public. There's a lot less public interest in statutory interpretation. When you're talking about getting into the nitty gritty of a particular law, it seems like something for lawyers and not really something for the public. Um, because the American public, I think, still has strong views about what the Constitution means and they believe they can interpret it and think about it. And once we're talking about statutes, people lose interest. And so this, you know, the President Obama's administration has, I think, been, been smart in making this shift because to the extent that in some contexts they would like to act with far-reaching executive power in the domestic context, much better to phrase it as statutory interpretation as opposed to constitutional interpretation because you simply get a lot more, less notice for those, um, for those issues. And so one, oh, excuse me, one, um, one prominent example of this, of course, is the, the immigration context where the executive has a tremendous mass of delegated authority to act on matters of immigration. And, and here I'm not even suggesting that the president has necessarily exceeded his powers, but what you see that's so troubling in a way is that so much authority has been delegated to the executive, it's hard to even figure out what authority he might have under the mass of statutes. I mean, you'd have to go back and look at all the various statutes relating to immigration to even know whether he has 
exceeded his authority. And, and that is perhaps very troubling for, for individual liberty when you can't, even someone who's a lawyer or a law professor, you know, would take a lot of time to figure out even whether the president has, has exceeded his authority. Um, and that I think is also a problem with Congress, right? Congress has simply given up this authority and, and so perhaps it's not surprising that the president has made um, such far-reaching claims about the authority that he has. And that feeds into the fact that executive discretion is, is quite substantial. I mean, the president has a lot of discretion to interpret and implement the law. And so once you have a broad delegation from Congress combined with executive discretion, it is a realm in which there's not a lot of law to kind of hang on to. And, and that can be very troubling for the expansion of government power, I think, as a whole. Can um, I jump in for a second? Mm -hmm. uh, e even if you yourself, you seem sort of sympathetic to the, this White House, uh, notwithstanding your obvious, you know, which team you're on. Um, but can you, for, for, since you're here to help people grasp these issues, mm -hmm. can you articulate briefly like, what is the case in the, that, even if you personally are not sure that that's the correct case, what is the case that Obama has gone too far in this area? In the immigration context? Yeah. Or, yeah, well, I mean, you know, I mean, he has, you know, I think the, the facts of this are, are very well known, right, that he has, you know, through, through a number of series of orders, right, has said that millions of people need not be deported, right? They're not subject to the immigration laws, and those laws are certainly on the books. And so there is really a sense that, that this is some, that this is an overreach, and I'm very sympathetic, actually, to that view. The notion is he's just, not faithfully executing the law. Right, but I think it's very hard to pin down what faithful execution is when you have such a large mass of statutes conferring authority. So it may well be that he has exceeded the law, but perhaps not. I mean, you have to kind of look at all the statutes. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's interesting that the Supreme Court has added a question to that case, right, about the take care clause, um, you know, shifting us from just a statutory question to a constitutional one, which may well be a realm in which they, it's, it's very interesting because there are really no cases where the Supreme Court has analyzed what the president's role is under the take care clause, and they've indicated that they might be about to do so. In the okay, okay. so let me jump in here uh, to keep things moving along. Uh, our fourth speaker is Walter Dellinger. He's a, par a partner at O'Melveny. He's best known as the former acting, assist uh, acting solicitor general during the Clinton administration, but as I've told Walter before, I was always much more excited about the fact that he was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, where he wrestled with, in particular with uh, war power issues that arose in the 1990s. Uh, he wrote some seminal OLC opinions about uh, the Haiti and uh, Bosnia interventions, and, and I believe, among other things, he was uh, the most important voice in articulating the notion that there are armed interventions that fall short of war in the constitutional sense in terms of their anticipated nature, duration, and scope, and that those sorts of sub-wars do not need prior congressional authorization, something that was cited by the Obama administration a couple decades later in, when going into Libya. Uh, Walter is a graduate of Yale Law School. He's a former clerk to Justice Black, and he is also taught at Duke Law School. Um, Walter, sorry, what do you think a president should do? I'm sorry, what should a Congress do when confronted? Let's stipulate with a president that's gone too far. Uh, we've seen an increasing trend of ha at least one chamber of Congress filing lawsuits against this president. We've also seen states increasingly jump into the courts as a, a, a venue for how they can get relief. What do you make of this trend and where are we going? Well, um, first of all, I think that what Congress and the states should not do is run to federal district court when they have a disagreement. This is particularly true of Congress. I think when you talk about a matter of statutory interpretation, it's important to realize that I think the reason for moving to a statutory claim is not simply that it gets less notice, but that it's a far less aggressive assertion of authority. A constitutional claim cannot be trumped. If the president had claimed a take care authority to violate statutes, you would have a take care issue. But the president's action in immigration, for example, you know, rests upon uh, 6 U.S.C. 2002, subsection 5, which says that the 
Secretary of Homeland Security shall establish national immigration enforcement policies and priorities. That's important because Congress has a remedy, which is to say it can revise the statute. Now remember the hearings. Uh, I was not able to testify at one of the hearings on this, but I would have held up a copy of Chapter 6 of the United States Code and saying, you, everybody on the committee, you're party to conferring upon the Secretary of Homeland Security the authority for determining national immigration priorities. You provided resources to deport half a million people uh, a year out of 11 and a half million people. Uh, the president has set those priorities. And what you could do and what not, a single member of the committee criticizing the president for being lawless has done, is introducing legislation saying, no, here are the priorities. Instead of conferring upon the secretary the responsibility and the duty of establishing immigration priorities, we're going to set the priorities. And everything in this administration suggests repeatedly that they would absolutely lawfully and faithfully comply with a congressional determination of what the priorities are. If Congress wants to deport family members first and let the felons stay, the president is going to do it. But this, this authority was conferred upon uh, the administration. Now, can, I, can I jump in? For yeah, a sure. But is there a limit to that? Let's say President Trump says, my EPA and environmental division in the Justice Department need to set priorities, and we have a priority of zero on enforcing you know, air pollution. Is the, that's OK, Look, right? I think if you read the, if you read the OLC opinion um, justifying the president's immigration order, it asks whether the president is carrying out this broad delegation in a manner that is consonant with the policies that Congress has sought to advance. To me, the one part of the opinion I have some question about is where it limited the authority of the president to grant deferred action with respect to parents of dreamers uh, on the grounds that it could not see the same rationale in other things Congress had done. So that it's actually a quite limited, uh, it's a quite limiting opinion. It limits the scope of the sweep of the textual authority the president has been given. Now, just because you have a minute left, what is the problem with going to the courts? If the, if problem they, if with going the, court, if the statute says it's okay, going they'll say court it's okay, is, right? Is, is, in the technical sense, there is no injury. Congress's job is done when it passes the statute. One house has no more interest in a statute than any of us sitting in this room does. And that's important because, uh, let me give you the two sentence version if I can. Why in a country of 320 million people do five men get to decide an issue like this involving 11 and a half million people? Now the reason five people get to decide those issues is that they have a job to do and that job is to provide redress to injured victims. That's the only justification. Marbury, I read to say, because we have a job to do of revolving disputes between real litigants and redressing injuries, there and only that gives us the authority to proclaim the meaning of the Constitution. And so absent injury, absent any justification for the nullification of what elected representatives of 320 million people want to do. That's why I think this case where the state of Texas is claiming an injury and House v. Burwell where the Congress is claiming an injury and how the president is interpreting the financing of certain provisions of the Affordable Care Act are a very, very radical, very radical step in the way of expanded judicial authority. All right. Well, so we're going to wrap up round one here with Sai Prakash. He is a professor at the University of Virginia Law School, where he focuses on separation of powers and particularly executive power. He teaches constitutional law, foreign relations law, and presidential power, and is the author of, among other things, uh, the new book, Imperial from the Beginning, the Constitution and the Original Executive, which argues that the office of the presidency was seen as more monarchical from its inception than some people sometimes argue. He's a graduate of Yale Law School as well, kind of a Yale mafia up here. And he's a, another former clerk to Justice Thomas. So, Sai, can you sort of draw together the two strands we've been hearing so far this morning about the Bush years, the, the Obama years, domestic foreign policy, and look forward to the next president? You know, what have we learned so far in the 21st century, and where might we be going? Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank 
Yeah, thank all of you for, for having us. This, uh, this panel is incredible, and I've learned a lot from them, and I have some reactions to what people said. I think the first lesson is go back and read the interviews that Charlie did with candidates in 2007, and on, I think it's available on the Boston Globe website. It's incredible. Uh, Charlie sent out queries to candidates, and they actually responded about real important issues of presidential power, constitutional law generally, including uh, uh, President Obama. I think you've tried to do this again, at least that's my recollection, and I don't think you've met with as much success because they realize they don't want to answer Charlie's questions, right? Because they'll be on the record and they don't want to say things that will come back to haunt them. And that ties into my first point. My first point is don't pay attention to what presidential candidates say about presidential power. They say all kinds of things that are designed to, to appeal to their base, but they don't really believe them or they don't believe them sufficiently to hold to, the, to them in the long run, right? Lincoln was a Whig who invade against the uh, invasion of Mexico, invade against presidential power. He suddenly discovered that he had, a, he had the authority to suspend habeas corpus and institute military tribunals, expend funds, expand the army when he was president. President Carter ran on a platform of making the Department of Justice independent. He went into office and his lawyers told him he couldn't do so, it would be inconsistent with the Constitution. He didn't do so, right? We still have this DOJ that's part of the executive branch. You know, President Bush talked about, uh, you know, no more nation building, and of course we're still trying to, to do that uh, in various parts of the world, in part, in, in part because of the wars that he launched with congressional approval. And I think the same is true for President Obama, right? He, he, he had uh, perhaps sincere desires to curb executive power, but when the rubber hit the road, when he, when he became president, uh, he realized there were things he wanted to do, and uh, sometimes uh, prior theories of law, prior theories of the Constitution got in the way. And Libya is the most conspicuous example, right? There was no authority from Congress to attack Libya. There was no claim that the 2001 or the 2002 AUMF authorized it. He did it anyway. Uh, Marty talks about Syria, but Syria is, you know, he didn't want to go into Syria, so he, he blamed Congress for not giving him the authority. It had nothing to do with any constitutional claim. Right? That was just a fig leaf. And that actually relates to my second point. Right? Presidents go to Congress for war authority only when it doesn't matter. <laughs> that is to say, they go to Congress if they think they're going to get authority. If they, they don't go to Congress if they won't. Right? And so Bush goes to Congress twice because he's quite sure he's going to get authority. Voila, he got the authority. I don't, think, you know, I don't think he would have gone there if he didn't think he was going to get it. President Obama did not go to Congress for Libyan authority because he knew he wasn't going to get it. And he went to Congress in Syria because he knew he wasn't going to get it. He went to them expecting them to say no, and then he could turn around and say they said no. So, you know, my, there's a, I have a friend, G.D. Nazelby at Northwestern, and he says basically presidents, as a, as a sort of matter of practice, go to Congress as a form of insurance. They can then spread the blame to others um, if, if the war doesn't go well, right? And we've seen the blowback that uh, candidate Clinton has gotten for, for voting for the Iraq war. Uh, in 2002, and that's a successful strategy for President Bush, right? He sh basically shared some of the blame with Congress. Um, um, so, you know, when we hear President Clinton, sorry, uh, candidate Clinton and candidate Trump talk about things, especially candidate Trump, yeah, you, There's your applause yeah. especially candidate Trump, don't take Trump. seriously what they say about the scope of presidential power. They don't, they haven't really given deep thought about it, and they'll be told other, they'll be told otherwise by their lawyers once they get into office, and they'll follow what their lawyers said. And, you know, I, I say this with respect to, you know, candidate Clinton. She's a, you know, she's a lawyer of, of great repute, and she's smart, but that, that didn't stop a former constitutional law professor from changing his mind about the scope of presidential power. You think candidate President Trump will follow what his lawyers say when they say no? If, you want, if he likes what they say, he'll follow it. If he doesn't, he won't. I mean, exactly. It's, you know. All right, so let's do round two. Uh, go back to Hina. Uh, and this is actually a good transition. So. Uh, you were starting to talk a little bit about congressional uh, abdication, I guess, of their constitutional role of deciding when the country is going to go to war or not. Uh, Sai was just talking about when presidents go to Congress and when they don't. Uh, notably, President Obama has not gone to Congress for explicit auth authorization to fight ISIS. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Congress's abdication of its war power and maybe tie it with how courts have dealt with war power issues when they've come before the courts. 
So um, I started addressing earlier on, Charlie, a little bit about Congress's abdication and why that's bro broken and why that's problematic. I think there are few outside or within government who don't think that it is a real issue that we are continuing to fight wars under the 2001 AUMF and who are also concerned about how much authority the Congress might give the executive branch. I think there have been some instances in which uh, President Obama hasn't wanted as much authority as Congress would want to uh, potentially give. So there's, there's a level of sort of irresponsibility there. And, and, but what I find a little bit more uh, well, interesting or perhaps challenging to talk about is what is the consequence and where does the judiciary come in? So with respect to targeting, um, you know, the substantive point is that there have been internal executive branch interpretations of different legal frameworks, the laws of war, the laws of sovereignty and self-defense that apply in terms of sovereignty contexts, um, the Constitution, and if you go through the memos, and they are, you know, better argued, argued what comes through is cherry-picking from some of the most permissive aspects of each of those frameworks with arguments against why the most restrictive aspects don't apply um, or may not be invoked in, in court. And that matters as a matter of international law in terms of the system that we helped set up. It also matters because um, there's no uh, review, uh, judicial review thus far, um, despite the fact that in the four instances in which the Supreme Court stepped in when talking about executive power and the authority to detain and prosecute, it ruled against the Bush administration. Um, but the courts have not engaged in and have deferred to questions of interpretation of legal authority to use lethal force, including against US citizens, including outside of areas of uh, recognized armed conflict, and that's a real problem because there have been, without Congress and without the judiciary, it continues to be a unilateral executive branch interpretation with executive branch claims that internal executive branch processes satisfy due process. Um, and I think when we think about what matters with respect to the next administration, that should give us pause. I'm reminded that back in 2012, when the prospect was of you know, a president who was a Republican, at that point, Romney, there were concerns within the executive branch about what limits would be exercised and what powers would be handed over. So there were discussions about policy constraints that might be recognized, even though the legal framework claims were so broad. That ended up leading to the presidential policy guidance with respect to targeting, which perhaps in the administration's sense of imminence, we've been imminently waiting for um, for a while now in terms of, of its release. Um, but it matters that we have legal constraints as well as policy constraints. And it matters not just because we might have a President Trump, and that might, should give us cause, what limits, legal limits, would be recognized, but it would matter even if it isn't President Trump and President, and its President Clinton. What are the limits, legal limits, recognized geographically, temporarily, with respect to the use of lethal force? And an area, I'm going to tie this in with Guantanamo as well, is in the ways in which claims of or a desire for maximum flexibility on the part of the executive branch, and that usually goes one way, maximum flexibility, can actually serve to constrain policy outcomes. So with respect to Guantanamo, I think potentially because of litigation decisions that were made early on in the Bush administration, potentially as a result of policy choices, both of which you talk about in your book, uh, Charlie, the the Obama administration continues to claim the authority, law of war-based authority, to hold people without charge or trial um, and potentially to close Guantanamo by bringing people to the United States, right? And I don't think anyone should make any mistake here. There would be significant separation of powers concerns if the executive branch so, sought to override congressional restrictions on bringing people to the United States. But closing Guantanamo, even if we close the physical place, doesn't end one of the original sins, which is claims of war-based authority to hold people 
who were not captured within or even in the context of armed conflict and continue to detain them indefinitely without charge or trial. All Regardless right, me, of what the, where that happens, that's not closing Guantanamo. All right, let me jump in here. And I also, I, I wanna praise you and the rest of the panel for the repeated plugs of my book. I think that's a positive <laughs> trend. And uh, let me just say it was written for geeks like you, so if you haven't picked it up yet, get on your smartphone right now. Um, Marty, let me turn back to you. Uh, I wanna ask you two questions, one is, to squeeze into your five minutes here, if you want to respond to Hina uh, regarding her concerns about targeting and this administration's approach to targeting law, please do. And then if you could segue to uh, something that pushes into these, this sort of other current we've been hearing this morning about congressional obstructionism, congressional paralysis and dysfunction, is when, to what extent is it legitimate or more legitimate for a president to push the boundaries of his or her authority uh, in a situation in which Congress is not living up to its constitutional role to pass legislation and confirm people? It's on, the on the last question, is this on? On the last question, I'll try to get to that in my five minutes, but if I don't, everything I know about it I learned from Walter, so I'm sure he'll be able to address it. Um, okay. Which is, which is, when is it appropriate to take aggressive uh, interpretations or to exercise aggressive de or broad delegations that Congress has given the President rather than trying to work out new legislation when the Congress seems dead set on not providing you with any new legislation. It's a very important question, and I hope we right, well, we'll have time to, to discuss it. Take but let me, let me use Hina's examples, among others, to address Sai, because Sai and I agree on a lot of the, a lot of the substance of war powers and, and the like. But I suppose the, the message I'm trying to convey is that I want to push back against what I'll call the cynicism, or Sai might just call it realism, that, he, that he's describing. Of course it is the case that every presidential candidate, when in office, will, will do things that might be inconsistent with what he or she said during the campaign. And for that reason, you know, candidates are, are very reluctant to make bold claims uh, without hedging on them and the like. But I don't think it was a mistake for pres that President Obama did, and I don't think he thinks it was a mistake, if, if I might, to make the sorts of claims about the law and the constraints of statutory constitutional treaty-based and international law that he made in the campaign. That was a big part of his campaign. I think he believes it, and I think it imposes dramatic constraints on the way that he acted or that any other president would act um, in terms of what options are on the table. Syria is a, is a good example. Um, I, I think that, I don't think at all that the president didn't want to take action. I think he wanted to persuade Congress and his allies in Europe and elsewhere that Assad needed to be stopped. There was intense pressure from within the administration from most of his close advisors to do so. And his failure to get international and congressional assent, he was unable to persuade them, led him to think it would be wrong for him to act unilaterally. Um, and so I think that's a very important example. But even where the president asserts authority, I think this president was thinking in the, in, the, in the campaign in 2008, and also as president, about the legacy, the precedent, the example that he is setting for his successors many years into the future, not just a possible Donald Trump, but any, any successors, both in terms of what assertions of authority are made. It's important that they're only statutory, that Congress gets the last word. It's important that there not be too many assertions of unilateral authority, let alone authority to disregard statutes and international law. But even where he does think he has the authority, so this is to get to Hina's example, yes, it, we took the view in the first two months of the administration that the president has the authority to detain during an armed conflict members of Al Qaeda who were captured. Right, that is an authority, you know, and he, there's a very valid substantive question in that regard, but yes, he thinks he has that authority, both as a matter of domestic and international law. But look at what he's done. He hasn't exercised it at all during this administration, apart from the legacy problem of Guantanamo. He's virtually cut back on the practice of war, long-term wartime detention, and instead moved in virtually every, every instance reflected in Charlie's wonderful book um, for another plug. That's not just, yeah, you really ought to all read it if you haven't already, to, to use the ordinary forms of law enforcement to deal with captives in this armed conflict because he believes that is the right policy. Similarly, the presidential policy guidance on, 
on, on, um, on targeting um, is intended, at least internally, and I hope externally as well by the end of the administration, to impose constraints beyond what international law um, require, at least in the view of the United States, in part because allies are uneasy about some of those international law claims, because he doesn't want to be pushing legal, the legal envelope too broadly where it's unnecessary to do so. The exact opposite of the Bush administration. Sai's absolutely right. They didn't need to make broad claims of, of authority because Congress had given them the authority with respect to both the war against Al-Qaeda and the war in Iraq. And they wrote 30-page memos. They wanted to write 30-page memos, the first footnote of which says, Congress gave us this authority, but ignore that. We're going to explain to you why we didn't need Congress's damn authority. And we're acting you. Right, right. right? Don't, we don't need to do that. And that's because they, too, wanted to set a precedent for future presidents and future administrations to have the idea and to act with the feeling of not being constrained by law. Okay. So and I think that makes a huge difference in the way the government works, but I can't prove that. I can tell you just from experience that that's true. So I'm going to flip the order from the first round here just because it seems like a good chance to ask. Uh, Marty was responding to you, Sai, to some extent, and can you respond to him and maybe also talk about, uh, in particular, your thoughts about uh, Libya in 2011, uh, both going in in the first instance without congressional authorization and then staying in without congressional authorization past uh, the apparent limits of the War Powers Resolution? Well, I, you know, uh, this, this panel's just so, so interesting and provocative. These people are so, so great, and Charlie's book is, is awesome. <laughs> um, Power Wars, that's a great book. It really is a Can great book. Debate about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd all agree. How so, many copies you know, are the right number of copies to buy? Go ahead, Sai. One of my favorite pieces of fiction is George Orwell's Animal Farm. And at the end of the book, I don't want to spoil it for you, but I'm going to. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the animals have a revolution, and they, you know, they, they cast out the humans. But at the end of the book, the pigs start walking on two legs and start having dinner with the humans while all the other animals are outside. And I think that's basically the Obama administration, the microcosm with respect to presidential power. With respect to presidential power, you can argue about the substances better, right? I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get into the policy, but on the question of presidential power, I don't think that there really has been that much of a difference between the Obama administration and the Bush administration in terms of the outcomes. I think there's been a lot of discussion about how they're relying upon statutes and not uh, constitutional authority. I don't necessarily mean that as an across-the-board criticism. When I hear Hina talk about the 2001 AUMF, the problem is the 2001 AUMF. It's not the Obama administration. The 2001 AUMF is a, is a blanket delegation of authority to go after persons, organizations, and nations who conducted 9-11 and those who harbored them. I asked my, con I asked my, my foreign relations class, could the Obama administration attack people in Saudi Arabia under the 2001 AUMF on the grounds that they helped the hijackers? hijackers? I think the answer is yes, because the 2001 AUMF is incredibly broad, right? And if you're going to, you know, and, and when I look at the, you know, the, the, the proposed ISIS AUMF by the Obama administration, I have to think this is a deeply cynical document because it doesn't repeal the 2001 AUMF and it has all these faux constraints, no enduring offensive military operations under this new AUMF. But if this, when, this, when this expires, the 2001 AUMF still is operative, right? There's a three-year limit to this proposed AUMF of the Obama administration, which is irrelevant because the 2001 AUMF is a backstop. So what's, you know, I just, I don't really see a, a major difference in outcomes. We still are taking, you know, I, th I thought Charlie had recounted how we were still taking some prisoners. One reason why we're not taking prisoners is because the president has decided to use more drones, and there's not, there aren't prisoners to take. Um, so I, this is not meant to be a criticism. I think, I, you know, I, I disagree with Hina about the, the attack uh, on ISIS. I think it is covered by the 2001 AMF, even if, even if uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS have splintered off. If, if Hitler had, uh, you know, if Goering and Hitler had a dispute, and they both fought against the United States during World War II. I think we could attack both of them. We don't, you know, Goering doesn't get a pass because he calls his country Fermany, and we're only going to attack Hitler's Germany. I don't think that, you know, I don't think that matters. Um, so I, I, my, I'm not trying to be critical. It may sound that way of the Obama administration. I'm just, as, as, as Marty would say, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be realistic. Fermany and Gary. <laughs> Gary. 
OK. Uh, well, let me switch now to Walter, who seemed to be itching to respond to you as you were talking. You know, first, do you want to respond to him? And as a part of that, can you incorporate into your answer, your five minutes, you know, if, are there, if you do stipulate that a president, Bush if not Cl uh, uh, Obama, or Trump if not Obama, uh, f considering which team you're on, uh, is lawless, what institutional arrangements can we have that will actually function to constrain that? Right, well, first of all, to respond to, to, to Cy, I think there's a very fundamental difference between claims of constitutional authority and claims of statutory authority. Even if you might say it gets you to the same place. Take, for example, to me, the most dramatic example is electronic surveillance, national security after 9-11. There's a statutory framework that is clearly directed at the executive branch. It sets up a court that you go to that's never had a leak to get authorization for national security wiretaps. It has They've a, had a leak now. It, it, that's true. It has a provision whereby in times of emergency you can start tapping and go to the special court. I even think you could have argued that it might be unconstitutional if you had to do so many wiretaps in such a short time that you couldn't comply with the time frame set for the exception, but you would have to comply as rapidly as possible. They simply said they don't have to comply with it. They don't have to comply, and they didn't tell anybody. So nobody knew. Nobody knew that they were absolutely violating consciously, deliberately, and secretly a constraint of the most profound kind. And that strikes me as something the likes of which we have not seen. The analog you could make about the torture, uh, use of torture uh, as well. That seems to me to be very different than an open statement transparently arrived at, claiming authority under an act of Congress and inviting Congress to correct you. That's what Lincoln did even when he suspended habeas corpus when Congress came into session, he submitted it to them and they indeed made alterations and cutbacks on what Lincoln had done. That seems to me, that's what I would say the Cheney-Addington doctrine was so uh, profoundly at odds with our constitutional order. Um, yes, I think there are institutional arrangements. I think it's better for a president to get his legal advice from the Department of Justice. My friends who've been White House counsel know that I have this view. It is, it but is that's in, what Bush did. It is intended to, to, to it is, that constrain. It is intended to, well, uh, I think uh, you are correct that that's not sufficient, particularly if the, uh, if the vice president's legal counsel is driving the actual decision-making process, it's not much of a constraint. But I do think there is a real advantage in having legal advice come from the Attorney General. I spent three months in the White House uh, in 93 before going to the Justice Department. And I think it's a very difficult place to make legal judgments. You're surrounded by people who are doing policy um, in, in a very intense environment. Everybody is looking at the 20-minute news feed uh, some people look ahead to the evening news that far in advance. These people are called visionaries in the modern, <laughs> in the modern White House. Um, but the Department of Justice has an ongoing institutional responsibility, and I think, I think to have the office, to put the best lawyer, do you, I would put Greg Craig or Neil Eggleston or Cliff Stone, I would put him as head of OLC. This is meant to be no disrespect to the individuals because I think there are institutional arrangements that make that the place. And I felt good that I had a White House pass. So I, was, I went every, every other day, I just went to the White House and went from office to office and said, what are you doing that you're not telling me about that I need to know? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's, that's where you need to center the authority, that operating agencies have a different dynamic and that there is a, a greater constraint if the only role of the department is not an operational role, but is a role to make legal advice. So that would be my preference. All right, so I'm gonna to turn to Naomi for the last uh, question of second round in a second, but if you see people handing out index cards, if you have questions you'd like me to ask in the final 25 minutes here, now's the time to make sure you've uh, written them down and turned them back in. So Naomi, can you uh, provide the grand climax to all this uh, by tying it back together, please, with this sort of recurring theme of congressional uh, ineffectiveness, and maybe add one a new dimension, which is uh, uh, you know 
presidential power in domestic administ the domestic administrative context vis-a-vis uh, -vis Congress. What's going on? Yeah, um, I'd hardly presume to be able to sum up this uh, this esteemed panel, but um, I do think you know, following up on some of the other comments that have made, I think that there is one um, quite significant difference between the claims about executive overreaching between the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And I think um, during the Bush administration, most of that discussion was confined to the realm of foreign affairs, which um, in which the questions about executive power are really quite different. I mean, we can have legitimate debates about what the scope of those powers should be, but but I think the executive power, I think most people would recognize, is different when it's focused outside our borders than, than inside our borders. And um, it, to me, the more interesting questions with this administration have really been domestic overreach, particularly in the administrative context. There are so many examples of really aggressive um, executive actions. And again, they're not constitutional claims, so maybe there's, a, there's sort of an air of minimalism about them, but I think the actions kind of speak for themselves and and so like in the immigration context you know we can we can talk about whether it was legitimate but it's really a very far reaching exercise of executive discretion um, some of the actions with delaying the implementation of obamacare you know again um, you know really taking those things much farther than they had ever gone before recess appointments you know which the supreme court invalidated you know again a very far reaching way of getting around the Senate's advice and consent process. You know, and I think the domestic overreach in some ways is much more troubling for our limited government and for separation of powers than the claims of authority, um, the claims of authority abroad. I also think um, another interesting thing has been the way um, independent agencies have worked in this administration. And you know, I'm someone who I've, I've written elsewhere that I don't really believe in independent agencies. I think they're all part of the executive branch and the president should be able to direct what they do. But I think it's, it's troubling when a president can sometimes direct what they want to do and sometimes avoid responsibility for what the agencies, agencies are doing. And so I'll just give a couple of examples. Um, you know, one is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, which um, is sort of a super independent agency. You know, its head cannot be fired by the president. It, it doesn't, it's not subject to Congress's appropriations powers. And they are taking a number of actions which I think have been really outside of the public visibility. For instance, they are gathering up financial records, credit card records of hundreds of millions of Americans. Um, there's been almost no discussion about this you know, by the president, and there's been no discussion about this by the president that I could find. And um, you know, so there's really no scrutiny or accountability for what, what these agencies are doing, because you can sort of say, well, the CFPB is independent. They're not really part of the administration. But then on the other side, you have something like the Federal Communications um, Commission and net neutrality. You know, it's been widely reported that the net neutrality plan that came out of the FCC was directed by the president. Um, and maybe the president should be able to direct the FCC in what policies they're pursuing, but then there has to be some, some ownership of that. And um, so and I think there are just a lot of examples of this with you know, domestic overreach and um, not even owning necessarily the overreach, but being able to hide behind various structures of, of bureaucratic independence, which I think is quite troubling. All but right. I, I would just say I do think yeah. also this problem ultimately is one for Congress, because Congress is really the only place where you can provide a truly effective check on this, and they're not doing All right, So that's that. a great transition to the first card from one of you. Uh, none of these are signed, so I can't credit the thinker. Uh, Congress people have promised that they would keep a President Trump reined in. What realistically can Congress do? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Walter. Well, I, uh, I think uh, just uh, on uh, the notion that the statutory claims have about them an air of minimalism, uh, it's real minimalism. If the president is saying, I will comply with what Congress directs me to do, and that to me is what is at the heart of this. You need, uh, uh, Congress can exercise the appropriation authority, it can uh, exercise the advice and consent authority. I think, I think a Congress, whoever is the next president, should 
the Senate should speedily confirm all executive branch nominees that are not thieves or knaves, whatever party it is, uh, to object to people because they agree with the president's policies. I think Congress has ample authority if they choose to exercise it rather than holding hearings, bringing lawsuits, and trying to make mileage out of claims of a lawless president when they haven't undertaken to enact legislation. So I think we're not in disagreement on that. Um, I think when, uh, it, it is unnerving when people say, don't worry about candidate Trump because he will have a White House counsel, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I think these people ought to, I would be more comfortable if I knew who his attorney general was gonna be and thought that the attorney general was gonna be making the judgments. You wanna add something? Sure. I think you know it's um, it's very hard for Congress. I mean, Congress has ultimately the the significant power, right? They have all the big powers if they choose to exercise them. But even um, but they still face the president's veto. So if the Congress wants to say something about immigration, and the president's going to veto it. They can't really place constraints. Or a recent example, they you know both houses of Congress you know they they passed a bill. Um, overruling the Department of Labor regulations on fiduciary relationships, and the president vetoed it, which it's certainly his prerogative to do, but um, it's very hard for Congress to take back this authority once they've given it away. But I'm very much in agreement with Walter that their solution to that should not be running to the courts. Even though I might disagree with you about whether they have an injury, I think it really weakens the institution for, of Congress when they're not passing laws, they're seeking legal redress through the courts. Uh, Charlie, can I, yes. let me just add one thing to to get back to the question you asked that we didn't have time to answer in the second, but it, it relates to this. Yes, a, a president that's dead set on acting autocratically might be able to do so in large respect, although I think Congress, through the, the, the confirmation and, the, and especially the budget process, has, has a lot of tools at its disposal to stop things from happening that they don't, right? That these sorts of soft ways of influencing the government that are actually quite profound, as Goldsmith des describes. But I do think what worries me is this general sense out there, and it's not just the right, the critics of the Obama administration that have created it, that, oh, presidents will be able to do whatever they want, that encourages that, whether it's Trump or some other future president, to think that that's right. You know, I can get lawyers to tell me I can do whatever the hell I want. Um, and it worries me on both sides. So, for instance, th th this idea that Congress is dysfunctional, a lot of the rhetoric coming out of the White House, as opposed to the things they were actually doing, Take immigration, for example. The president didn't do anything on immigration. Jay Johnson, the Secretary of Homeland Security, issued a, a directive because Congress authorized him to do so, not the president. Yeah, but and he did it with. And he, no, he did it. Absolutely. <laughs> no, of course he did it with the with the president's approval. And, and of and course, that, there's and nothing, direction. There's no Ill, nothing illegitimate about that. But the point is that the rhetoric at the time was. Congress isn't acting, and therefore I have to take the law into my own hands, and I've created law. Or, and I understand why the, there's political pressure to do that and to say those things. It's not as sexy to, as to say, you know, to take a paragraph out of the legal brief and say, since Congress will not legislate, I am asking the Secretary of you know, Homeland Security to exercise his discretion under section blah, 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 blah of the Immigration and Security Act to provide, you know, that Congress conferred upon him in 1986 to delay immigration of, right? That's not what they do. They don't, uh, the public discourse is not in terms of the boring statutory authorities that Congress has delegated to the president. And I would, I guess, caution Democratic administrations to change the rhetoric to be more, a little bit more modest in the way that they sell things to explain that they are not acting as an imperial or an autocratic presidency. Marty, I'm gonna stay with you for this next well, question. How should we think about the legal and moral defensibility of expanded drone warfare of President Obama versus the enhanced interrogation techniques of President Bush? We, had, a, we had an entire panel here at ACS two years ago devoted to that question. Um, I think it's probably online, and it's very much worth watching. Would you want it? No citation. This is live journalism. What do you think? <laughs> um, no citation. No footnotes. I, mean, I just, in terms of, I don't have anything to add to what one thinks of the moral question. I think everyone in this audience, everyone watching this panel, is just as entitled as I am as a lawyer to assess what they think of as whether it's moral or not. 
Um, for that matter, I think that there are many legal questions, a whole slew of legal questions associated with the use of lethal force and drones in particular, both under statutory law, internal executive branch law, uh, executive orders and the like, international law, both, both in terms of sovereignty and human rights and, and the laws of war, um, and statutory law. Uh, um, these, the legal question does not reduce to a single question. I mean, I think, I hope that the memoranda that have come out, that have been released, demonstrate that these are very hard and delicate legal questions each of which deserves and warrants and insists upon its own careful assessment, and then people will come to different views about the law. The big difference, I think, whether you think that torture is worse than, than the use of force against enemy forces or, or not as bad, the, the structural question that we're here to discuss today, and it may not be as important as the moral question, but it's, an imp it's for us constitutional lawyers is, can you violate a statute, whether it's torture or the use of lethal force? Is it okay to violate a statute or international law when you think it's in the best interest of the United States to do so if you're sitting in the Oval Office? I think the answer to that question really does matter, and the answer was very different in the Bush administration than it is in the Obama administration. So I it doesn't were... make it the be-all and end-all. It's just the important question for us constitutional lawyers. So, so I thought you were going to say, and I'll go to you, Hina. Uh, actually, that was my intent anyway. To uh, that torture is always illegal no matter what. Killing can be legal or not legal depending on the circumstances, and the argument is whether the circumstances are met in this particular case versus that particular case. That's the and short version And the people who think that killing is all, you know, worse than torture are omitting that nuance. What do you say, Hina? That's where I was going to start, actually, Charlie, which is I think one significant difference is, is torture is absolutely banned, no exception whatsoever. Now, there's certainly more argument that can be had about the circumstances under which lethal force can be used. And that argument over the course of the Obama administration, especially starting in around 2009, when the drone campaign really took off, has been, I think, the most contested one. And I will footnote this, sorry, footnotes, by saying that the issue is not just drones, right? It matters whether it's a helicopter gunship or a poison-tipped umbrella. It's the legal rules, and part of what's remarkable is the extent to which the legal rules have been contested, but it has largely been a conversation about the most elemental rules, fundamental rules, that has taken place amongst essentially elites, as opposed to more broadly um, amongst the public, this notion of acceptance of war-based authority in places in which pre-Bush administration administrations were not claiming war-based authority, right? So for many of us who thought at the end of the Bush administration, at the beginning of the Obama administration, the threat of a new normal uh, global war was going to be um, put to an end, I think there's been deep disappointment. They're not the same kinds of claims, absolutely, with respect to global wars, but when you go through the legal arguments and the statutory analysis and whether there are constitutional claims that could be brought even by citizens subjected to this hugely important claimed power, um, I, I fear that the outcomes are very much the same. And what we're left with at the end of a Republican administration and a Democratic administration is something really quite extraordinary, which is a legal and bureaucratic infrastructure that has become entrenched, threatens to become further entrenched, that permits the use of lethal force based on internal interpretations of war-based authority with a policy overlay of safeguards that could be cast easily aside and no judicial review at this point <coughs> whatsoever. Charlie, could I, could well, I let's let Walter talk. Just a 30 second book note. Um, <laughs> Jefferson Powell, uh, once you finished reading all of Charlie's books, <laughs> I like this. There's, there's, there's a new book out uh, by Jefferson Powell at Duke called Targeting Americans The Constitutionality of the Drone War. Very subtle, nuanced, thoughtful, reflective. But its opening sentence is on September 30th, 2011. The executive branch of the United States government deliberately killed a citizen of the United States. That sets the issue quite starkly, but Jeff's approach to it is to see how difficult these, these and contextual these questions are. Let me so that, that actually leads. Okay. So one striking thing about Jeff's book that I take issue with, and this is a response to Hina, is Hina's right. I mean, the, 
if, if we were to have you know, a more robust public debate about, for instance, the use of, of, of force, the result might well be much more assertive, much more broad and, and aggressive authorities that are given to the president. As you can see, and not only on, on the right. So Jeff, Jeff insists that we were wrong to say that the due process clause applies to the use of force. Right? He would say that the Constitutional Bill of Rights doesn't apply at all to the, to the president's conduct of war. A lot of people on the left and the right have said that. I don't think that that's right. Similarly, um, I, I think he not, I don't, I think it's a mistake to think that these, that the end of the Obama administration were in the same place we were in the Bush administration. So just look at the national security strategy that Paul Ryan released, the Republican national security strategy that he released, I think yesterday or the day before. It is back to the global war on terror. It insists quite starkly that our war is not only against Al Qaeda and affiliated forces and ISIL, but all Islamic terrorists of any kind and that we should use, it, it's a little bit unclear, of course, about how we should deal with it, but basically suggesting we should use force to prevent Islamic terrorists the world over from developing the capabilities of striking, right? So it's right back to 2003, both in terms of international law and, and, and domestic law in insisting that there's a global war against all Islamic terror everywhere and that there's a very broad, th there ought to be a very broad theory, not just of preemption, but of preventing these groups from being able to develop the capabilities to strike someone long before they've actually struck. That's a huge difference as a practical matter um, between the Republican vision of what the president's war powers ought to be and the Obama administration's um, authority. So, you know, this might be the best that you're ever going to get, is what I'm <laughs> suggesting. And I, I have yeah. a response to that very sure. quickly, sort of the 30 second response, which is that I'm not saying that, you know, Paul Ryan's vision is exactly the same as the Obama administration's vision with respect to the uh, use of lethal force and prevention. Um, what I am saying is that given the interpretations, the legal interpretations and the legal restrictions recognize there is so much malleability in there that you could get to the same point when you're thinking about interpretations that include undefined associated forces, for example. And I do think that there's a real difference between what the 2001 AUMF author, authorized and what is being read to authorize now. But, but just as importantly, I think, in terms of the policy debate and the public debate, I think we would have a more robust public debate if there wasn't as much continuing secrecy surrounding the lethal force program. I think that there's still too much secrecy with respect to the legal standards, the policy issues that might be um, helped by the release of the so-called playbook. I'm somewhat skeptical, I don't know. But, but think about the fact that in our name, under this policy, people are being killed whose numbers and identities have not been disclosed. The consequences have not been discussed in any kind of robust way domestically. They're being talked about internationally and certainly in the countries in which these policies are being carried out that we don't have the results of investigations with respect to credible allegations of wrongful killing that the president has recognized and named the killings of U.S. citizens, promised that the families of U.S. citizens would receive the results of investigations into uh, killings, but has not done the same with respect to non-citizens, who are the vast majority of people who are uh, killed in these kinds of strikes. And there's a real danger that the public debate is not just skewed, but entirely inaccurate without adequate taking into account the costs and consequences um, and that we as a public are deeply distanced, deeply distanced from the actual realities on the ground of the people who are being subjected to these policies. All right, let's go to the next question. Uh, this one is near and dear to my heart. Can you please comment on the increased use of presidential signing statements? Uh, I'm going to direct this to Walter because when he was head of OLC in the Clinton administration, uh, he wrote what became a seminal OLC opinion uh, about signing statements in which he uh, uh, sort of approved of their use as, as a constitutional mechanism. And of course, signing statements are uh, statements a president makes when he signs a bill into law saying such and such sections of this 
uh, new statute uh, violate his constitutional authority and so will not be enforced literally as written uh, rather than vetoing the bill. Big controversy in the Bush years. They had been used rarely until the Reagan, second term of the Reagan administration and then have sort of picked up since then. And one of the things that President Obama's administration did that disappointed some on the left was he, it sought to rehabilitate signing statements after the Bush years by continuing to issue them, uh, but with legal theories that they thought were not crazy. Go ahead, Walter. <laughs> well, uh, uh, only Charlie Savage could take something as technical as signing statements and make a great journalistic issue out of it as you did at the Boston Globe. Um, you know, first of all, you know, the issue is not and cannot be signing statements. The issue has to be when can the president decline to enforce an act of Congress which the president believes to be unconstitutional. And which he signed himself into law. Which he is signing into law. Rather than vetoing Oh, I understand that. I, I, I will come to that. So <laughs> one, when a president does that, then he ought to tell people that he's doing it. And he ought to do it as soon as he signs the law. So I, it's not the statement. It's the, right. it's the action. Now, I, I don't believe in the modern era that it's feasible to say that a president's authority to comply with the Constitution and not enforce provisions or abide by constraints he believes to be unconstitutional. I do not believe that his only choice is to veto the Omnibus Military Appropriations Act with ships at sea and cut off military pay because it has a provision buried in 1,300 pages that tells the President how to conduct the foreign policy of the United States and he has to appoint certain people to certain international boards or whatever the issue is, large or small, the president can say there's a provision of this bill which could be construed. Look at Zivotofsky to, mm -hmm. to, if you're directing, if this omnibus State Department Appropriations Act is directing me to put Jerusalem, Israel on passports, that's not, that's an incursion on the president's power to recognize foreign governments, et cetera. I, I have no, no trouble with that. Now, I think that this administration in any administration, is, there is no presidential administration that ever has or ever will step aside from the proposition that the president has the authority to decline to enforce laws that he believes to be unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has repeatedly authorized the president to do that. When the president has done it, the Congress has acted, is, the court has asked whether he was right or wrong, not said that it was uh, on, on the merits of the claim. Most recently in the Jerusalem passport. Right, right. Yes. so, I, but I, I think where this is where I think Sai may want to jump in because yes. I'm gonna set you up to disagree with me. I think it's a, it, it's a relatively respectful of the rule of law position to do what this president did with the Defense of Marriage Act. When there were those that said, if you believe it's unconstitutional, you ought to simply decline to enforce it. The president said, that would mean that I am unilaterally determining the issue. But if I enforce it, the issue will be brought in court because Ms. Windsor or someone like her will be bringing a lawsuit. But I am directing, you know, or acknowledging that the attorney general and the solicitor general are gonna take the position that we do not believe that there has been no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. We do not believe that it generally serves any legitimate purpose or is related to ability to perform in the society. And therefore, we think it has to be judged by a stricter standard. And we don't believe it's defensible under that standard. But by enforcing, he allows the court to make the final decision and gave Someone it its best, its, its best judgment. So let me, let me if, if a off. president yeah. had said that, would he, but I, I don't believe that any president, I don't know of a case where a president has signed a single piece bill saying it's unconstitutional. It's always a provision, as far right. as I so know. So Cy, the modern world, omnibus bills, government wouldn't function? What, do you, what is your response? I, I think the modern practice where the president has a, you know, has a signing ceremony where people clap and then he issues a statement saying, by the way, six of these provisions are unconstitutional. I, that, that is a modern practice. Right? The old practice was presidents would veto bills that contain unconstitutional legislation on the grounds that they actually had to veto it that they had no choice because they had to defend the Constitution. And I understand the sort of dilemma the presidents find themselves in, tells them in the modern practice where you have a CR that, that is the entire budget. 
On the other hand, if, if, if you're in Congress, it is, you know that the, there's very little downside to putting in things in, in a bill that might be unconstitutional because you know the president's going to sign it anyway. And so this encourages members of Congress to lard up bills with constitutionally uh, dubious propositions because they know it's going to be signed and they know there's a chance that the future president will enforce the provision that the current president thinks is unconstitutional. So I think from a static perspective, if we just look at the particular CR and say, oh my God, if, if he doesn't sort of sign this bill, Washington will come, you know, come to its knees and we don't want that because we're in Washington. Um, it looks like he, he has no other choice, but if you look at it from a dynamic perspective and think about the incentives over the long term, there will be fewer bills that have constitutional problems if the president makes it clear, I am going to veto every bill that has a constitutional problem. And you'll have to come back from recess to deal with it. Well, you do that once and they get the message next right. time. They're not going to, you know, he can, he can call them right back into session and say, you're going to have to do this over again, right? I have the power to call you back into session. There's no budget. Pass a budget without this, this garbage provision in it. Yeah. So I, I agree with Walter that the president, I don't believe the president has to enforce statutes that he thinks are unconstitutional, but the, the crucial issue there, I think, was whether or not he could sign a bill that he thought was unconstitutional and just basically decide not to, not to enforce part of it. No, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, so I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, but uh, they're waving the stop sign, and we do have our set piece, Walter, so this helps you anyway. Leading into Cliff Sloan, the chairman of the uh, ACS Board of Directors, who's going to introduce Neil Eggleston, the current White House Counsel. Walter, what do you think of the institution of the White House Counsel? What should happen to it? Does it not save us from all ills? I believe, it, I believe the White House Counsels should be abolished. Uh, <laughs> not, not, in, not entirely. I think you need an ethics officer and you need someone to make contracts for the people that tend the Rose Garden. <laughs> but that, and this sets you up, Neil, that uh, uh, Griffin Bell and I actually believe this, that in terms of giving legal advice to the president, that advice should come from the attorney general. Uh, and the attorney general should get that from the office of legal counsel and you should put the person you, whose advice you want in those, in those positions. I think it's easier to give to have some distance. Now, you know, all right, I'll go up one more, and there's got to be somebody at the president's elbow to help interpret these, these obtuse OLC opinions. I understand that. Uh, all right. But uh, basically, I do think that we're going to hear from someone who has served, two people who have actually served greatly in the White House Counsel's Office, even though it should have been abolished. Right. On that note, join me in thanking this panel for their time. Please stay and listen to Neil. <laughs>